I was playing against Estonian, a uh, very known international master, Kalle Kik. I know him for many, many years because uh, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, we are the three Baltic countries. But naturally, we know each other. We know each other, right? So uh, it's like a small family amongst uh, chess players, at least chess professionals. We like to talk with each other before, after the games. And um, against Kale, I had played a long, long time ago. Maybe, maybe 10 years ago, maybe, maybe, okay, eight years ago. So we haven't really played many games. I, I mean, specifically against Kaleb. So I had almost no expectations what to, what to play, uh, what he's gonna play. So again, I just play the same, E4. Um, I played E4 and um, I was expecting um, some sort of a Sicilian because for some reason all the Estonians like the accelerated dragon. I don't know why. He played e6. I, got, I thought, okay, that's cool. I got the center. Knight f6, knight c3, e5. And um, this, by the way, is very interesting. Because black voluntarily uh, is walking with the king. But for some reason, he's doing great. Take it, take it. Let's say, whatever, knight of three, bishop d6, king e7, knight c6. Black is actually doing pretty okay. So, I didn't really want to test it. And I've been playing ever since some five years, knight e2. Uh, knight e2, the idea is that I don't allow any bishop g4 ideas pins if I play knight of three. Yeah, so... He played c6, very typical move. Uh, Threaten with uh, b5, Threaten with some point d5. So I played a4. And I know the theory, sort of. I mean, I know there is this line after bishop b7. If I play g3, he can take it and push d5. So this I know. And uh, now the point is, if I take it twice, he recaptures with the queen, and my rook and h1 is under attack. And if I respond with e5, knight g4, the pawn is under attack. If I respond with e6, attacking the knight, he cannot obviously take it because he loses the knight here, here, and here. And actually, this is good for black. So I had some vague memory about this. Uh, if he would play bishop e7, and check this out, why this is important. So he plays knight e7, again, a typical move. So, I, I, okay, I play g3. So my idea is one of the one of the illustrations. Here, 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 and here. This is usually how this variation is played out. So there's something like bishop e3, f4, and boom, 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 boom. Everything goes. At the king side. And um, yeah, for, for black it's not very easy to find a good setup. And I was hoping he's going to do that. And now, imagine he plays d5. I was like, what? What is this? You cannot play like this. Because you're supposed to play d5 with the knight on b8. And the bishop on e7. Not with the knight on d7. So I thought, okay, great, awesome. I take on d5. Um, he took with a knight, but to be honest, if he would take with a pawn, I have a great choice. Probably I would play d takes here and bishop g2. And I was expecting him to play something like bishop g4, threatened here, to sell the pawn on d5. I would have castle. He can give a very nasty check. I can go away. He can even try to go for some berserk attack with h5. Because I gonna take it, take it, that's probably a mate. But I felt that all of this is fishy. I mean, there's no way, there's no way this attack can work for you by not having prepared it. The king is in the center, there's some queen b5, there's some knight f4, uh, just no way, it works. So, that was my thought process. I thought this is a mistake, what he's doing. So I took it, he took with the knight, nothing changes, I take it, 
nothing changes. Although, you know, the engine says bishop g2 is also advantage for white. Pretty large. Here. Here. And here. I guess because of the king side, but if I would have to give the evaluation and uh, evaluate this to be much better for white, I wouldn't have said that. I would have said this is unclear. Maybe, maybe slightly better for white because I have included weird a4 for no good reason. But the engine really likes this for white. Yeah, maybe there's some bishop g5, knight f4, I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm so ahead in development because black is still behind development. So that was that was actually news to me. I mean, after I was checking with the engine. Anyway, I took an e5. Knight e5. Okay, knight f3 is made in one threat. Let's not blunder that. Bishop g2. And I thought... I thought that he's going to play bishop g4. Sell the pawn, try the knight of 3. I would have castled. Uh, I want to play h3 next at some point. So he gives a check. I ignore it. He plays h5. I attack it. He goes for a super attack, h4. I just didn't believe it again. I just didn't believe this is ever going to work for him. So there's no way he can checkmate with me just one rook and the king is in the middle of the board, wide open. I mean, knight e4, I'm not sure. Maybe there's some other moves as well. Maybe there's even something like knight e4, right? Knight e4, knight e4, something like this could be even an idea. What is this guy doing here? So he, he was thinking quite a lot. And boom, he played bishop c5. I was like, what? What is this? The pawn on d5 is just under attack. And the more I was thinking, I got a weird impression that he has a very good compensation. And I don't know how, but I completely missed the bishop before. Intermats move. So the point is, include this move to push away the knight and just take on d5. It's a free pawn. For example, he tries to defend it with some counter-attack. The pawn is weak. That's a problem. That's a problem. So there's a major pressure on the pawn on d5. Short castle, and before I take on f6 and take on d5, I secure the pawn on b2 because the queen on f6 could be protecting the pawn, uh, uh, could be attacking the pawn on b2. And this threat seems to be pretty much inevitable. Maybe even knight e5 first and then take on f6. So it's all about the order of the moves. And uh, for some reason I took with the queen. Yeah, now after the game I couldn't even explain it. Uh, why? Why I played queen d5 without even looking at bishop 4 But this is where the fun starts actually. That, that is a bad IQP. Yeah, that is a bad IQP. And uh, he could have played queen c7, continue to play the gambit, because bishop f4, this is pinned, and there's just nothing. There's just nothing. Actually, it's his position is a complete disaster. Complete disaster. So I'm ahead in development, and um, he cannot ever play bishop b7. The pawn on b7 is also under attack, so he's just completely paralyzed. So he took it. He took it. I played bishop g4. I was like, oh, here we go. Here we go. After the game, we discussed that maybe bishop g4 was a mistake. Uh, we felt that maybe bishop f5 had to be played. And for some reason, after the game, we analyzed only bishop b7 here, here. And bishop c2, and we correctly felt that there's going to be definitely compensation for black, and, and I think it is. So, knight e3 is a threat, bishop d3 is a threat, this is rook is very active, some rook e8 general moves. At this point on b2, probably I'll have to simply sell for uh, the need to continue my development. And I, actually, after bishop f5, I don't have to take the pawn on b7 at all. So I can play short castle. Long castle is the big idea why he develops the bishop on c8 and just go back. And apparently he cannot take the pawn on c2 at all. Take it, bishop 4 
there's rook c1 threat. If he plays knight a3, oops, there's another problem. This king is very unfortunately placed. Now f5, bishop f5, chain doesn't change anything. Rook d7 just drops many things. So maybe even rook d7, the, the win, the easiest win could be something like rook c1. He's just losing a lot. A lot. And of course he doesn't have to do that. He doesn't have to take it. So I guess rook e8. And I just play bishop f4. And that's it. He has no compensation. So white is pretty active, and maybe after knight f4, I'm not sure what could be the uh, the continuation. Maybe knight c3. He cannot take this pawn, and this pawn probably is again extremely dangerous due to rook b1, and the pawn on b7 is under attack. Right? So he cannot really take th that pawn back, and uh, white has fully uh, finished the development. But he played bishop g4, and this is very logical, because he is threatened with knight of 3. So I didn't really have a choice, because if I do something else like knight c3, now this compensation felt huge. It felt huge. I mean, there's rook e8, there's knight of 3, what is my king doing here? So just for one pawn, I didn't want to test this. So all I have to do now, I have to take the courage and take on b7. I have to take on b7 and defend, and defend my two extra pawns. Of course I knew what I'm entering, but I simply did not see any other choice, what else I can do. So I took on b7, and I calculating, I was calculating a lot of crazy ideas here. First, he gives a check on f3. <laughs> I cannot go here, that's a mate. I cannot go here, that's something very bad. So I would have to take on f3, take it, and now it seems that this rook is under attack. I have a very beautiful way to solve the problems, which is Shul Castle. He cannot take on e2, there's gonna be rook e1, that's a pin. So this I saw, castle, rook e1. And you know what's amazing? He has zero compensation for the pawns. Zero. Rook e8, and very powerful bishop e3. Take it, rook e3, and king f2. Actually, this line I saw, 94. So I'm simplifying the position, and I'm simply entering an endgame where I have an extra pawn and a two pawn advantage at the queen side. This should be an easy win. And that's the best he can do in this line. I was also calculating short castle. Sacrifice the exchange, try to win time. And it was incredibly scary because my light score weakness says, oh my goodness, this is so dangerous. But that's why there is calculation. We calculate. Having the bishop isn't going to compensate. No, 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 no. It's simply not enough. Again, I cannot go here, that's a mate. I go here, and that's it. Black has no follow-up, no follow-up. I mean, one check, maybe here, king goes here. Some activity, but he's down so much material, it just cannot work. Of course, I had to go play that. And after bishop b7, he played rook b8. Bishop g2. And now, pray that this is gonna hold. <laughs> Because he's so much ahead in development, so I pretty much felt like I I'll have to show very, very precise defense, but it's worth it. It's worth two pawns. So now if he gives a check, I can use the same idea of short castle, rook e1. Probably it's playable. But I was gonna play simply king of one. h3, g4, and this knight on f3 is hanging. So something like uh, rook d8, thread them with the mate on d1, I just play bishop p3. And there's nothing. I have two pawns. So he played show castle. I cannot castle because my my knight on e2 is under attack and there's this very unfortunate idea. So I'm simply down a piece. I cannot do that. So I played h3. 
And now I have to again make sure there is no immediate follow up like Bishop E2, King E2, and Rook E8. And it looks incredibly scary because Bishop E3 allows Rook B2. I can play King F1, but I think I would gather the courage to play Rook D1. So he has a discovered check, but it gives nothing. So maybe in the best case scenario, he wins a pawn, but I'm incredibly active. I have two bishops, I have extra pawn, there's no threats. So I, I felt that this should be winning. And the same applies also for knight g4 check here, knight f2. So again, I play rook d5, two bishops, healthy position. This knight actually is going to be stuck. And uh, I was pretty happy about it. Um, yeah, if he gives a check on f3, I just play king f1. And this knight is trapped. So he could do that. Any rook d1 ideas, I always play bishop f4, nothing really changes. So he play bishop f3, and very precise king f1. So it's a battle for the f3 square, because if I take it here, this knight is incredibly powerful. So that's why I play king f1, keep control, I mean part control of the f3 square, because if he takes it, I control this square, the knight cannot go there. He played rook e8, threatened with some threats. I played knight c3, and you know, <laughs> this is really hilarious. I'm walking, I'm walking, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I see this incredible idea he has. What if, what if he gives a check on e1? What if he gives a check on e1? I play king d1, he plays bishop takes in g2. I was, oh my goodness, what this is. Rook h2, rook g1, he gives a fork on f3, I lose the rook. I was like, oh, oh, did I just blunder that? Did I just blunder that? I come back to the board, oh, he has the knight on e5. So, thanks to the current chess rules, the rook cannot jump over the knight. <laughs> Otherwise, that would be a really beautiful combination. <laughs> Rook e1, king e1, bishop g2, and this rook on h1 is trapped because of the knight of 3 check. So, <laughs> even gramsters can sometimes have some hallucinations. So, I was very happy to find out this is not gonna work. And now, now I think the problem for black is he's running out of moves. He has no good moves because my next move, probably, is going to be knight e5. Um, so let's say he plays bishop d4, trying to slow down my development. I play knight b5. He goes back, bishop f4. So he cannot do that. Uh, if he goes bishop b4, again, threatened with something, I cannot develop my pieces. I just play knight e5. And you know, actually, this was pretty scary. This was pretty scary because. I have to make sure there is no mate on e1. So some kind of a knight jump. Knight g4 I take it. Knight e3 take, check, that's not a mate. Knight c4, bishop e2 check. King e2, some discovered attack. So it was a bit scary, but that's why we calculate. We make sure this is not gonna happen. Um. Right, so that's why, I mean, he was running out of moves really here, and he played a6. I was also thinking about some bishop h5 ideas, maybe he needs to retreat for the bishop to threat with knight f3, or bishop g6 to go after the pawn c2. So I thought there should be something linked with g4. Bishop g6 and something like f4, but actually here f4 is not great. Boom. Some tactical tricks. I don't really take it. The king is in danger. Although the engine still gives some advantage to white. Yeah, this is incredibly, incredibly crazy. Uh, no, he hasn't been playing much blitz recently. He just simply had no choice after the bad opening. He played a6 to stop knight b5, which would close the b file. And now, 
I just go with the other D of 95. And again, he's running out of moves. There's no moves for him. Maybe I have to show, by the way, this idea. If I take it, I play King G2, there's 91. Oops. That's that's a problem. That's a problem. So 91 fork is pretty unusual idea. So I play 95 with the idea to play 93 or maybe B3, 93, Bishop E3. And yeah, he's, he's running out of moves. Uh, there was no there was no bishop b4 95 93 i take on f3 that's not a mate that's not a mate you see i have square on g2 it's very tempting it's not a mate so you're gonna do that and that's why he played rook c8 some random move i was i was expecting him to play rook d8 actually take take and now i have c4 i secured the knight on d5 Rook e4, b3, knight e4, rook b1, and even if he wins the board on b3, somehow, let's say, rook b1, I can always finish my development, I still have the second pawn. But to be honest, I'll tell you honestly from the start, this was incredibly risky, it was incredibly risky. And uh, apparently there's no compensation for black at all. I was so surprised when I found this out on the on the engine at home because I thought there's totally, totally a compensation. There's no compensation at all. Yeah. So what happened here is I simply play bishop before, I finished my development. He took on d5, and that's when I knew I'm gonna win this. Because now there's no activity for black. Uh, I'm not sure what else he's supposed to do here because I want to take on e5, I want to take on f3. Um, maybe he should have kept more pieces on the board with something like bishop h5, but I don't know, I could always already play rook e1, trade more pieces, there's no mate. And what happened here is that we directly went to the converting phase. So, engine says bishop d2 is the strongest, by the way. Keep the bishop alive, c4... Bishop a5, <laughs> some kind of uh, intermezzo move to keep the bishop on d5 alive. I, I'm not thinking like that. So I saw that I can simplify the position by playing rook d1, allowed to take on a4, and I know that this should be technically winning position. Although it maybe is going to be slightly slower. So despite the fact that we have obstacle bishops on the board, I have a chance to organize two connected pass pawns at the queen side, and uh, I just have to make sure I keep at least one pair of rooks on the board. Rook b6, bishop c4, I managed to activate my pieces, I target the pawn on a6, and um, if he would go something like rook f6, my idea always was to play f5 and bishop d3. And even if I have to, I can ignore the pawn on f5. Something like g takes, even if I have to, I can always play king g2, f4, king f3. So these double pawns don't mean a thing at all for black. But I think I can simply take it. I can even take it. So the game pretty much uh, was wrapped up very quickly. King g2, rook f6. Uh, one more, one of the final decisions here I had. I thought to play rook d5. And continue with my original plan. But then I thought I'm keeping too many pieces on the board. So he's gonna play g takes, and this is slightly longer game. So I I had a very clear idea that I need to trade one pair of rooks to simplify the position. And now he cannot really take it and took take on a four because of this very nice idea. Check rook e5. The pawn a5 is under attack, and the bishop is overloaded. So the bishop cannot protect the pawn on a5 and it could, cannot protect against the mate so he has to make a big choice obviously the mate threat is the cdr choice so i win the third pawn at the queen side and that's it that's the end of the game because three pass pawns this is going to decide the fate of the game yeah the, the other rook is passive so rookie one is a very nice way to simplify the position you play king of eight take it and i just make sure i keep one pair of rooks on the board so if he would play g takes on f5, I had a feeling that this is winning. 
I had a feeling that this should be winning because I matched with my king here and somehow it should be winning. But again, there's a simple truth, simple um, technique. If you're not 100% sure from a dominating position, why toss a coin? Why toss a coin? I, I don't need this. Even if this is winning, I would just take with a bishop. I would just take with a bishop. G takes bishop f5. And always keep the rooks on the board. And I can always enter this bishop endgame when I'm absolutely 100% sure that that is winning. Not sooner. So he played rook d6. Of course, I decline. There's no need to trade rooks. Another fine move f4. I had a feeling I'm going to need this pawn to force some space advantage. Push for the pawns, pieces behind. That should be the rule in chess. Rook f6, king f3, g takes, bishop f5. Of course, I don't trade rooks. h6, bishop d3. And now I even have no uh, weaker pawn structure. This is another target. Rook b7. Actually, you know, if he would have played something like uh, rook d8 and here. I would have traded the rooks because this is an extra pawn and now that's gotta mean something right so i have another pass pawn so here i'm totally sure this is winning there's even no slightest risk so i would have simply uh taken taken the rook and just transposed this to the obstacle bishop game. he didn't do that he played yeah by the way there was this idea rook d7 rook, rook b6 targeting this pawn bishop d6 rook goes here With f5 instead of bdx on c4 being accurate. Where? There's no bdx on c4. There's no bdx on c4. Um. Ah, oh, you mean bishop c4? Ah, oh, you mean here? No, f5 is also great. It's also a great move. It's a great move. But I played it later. I played it here. Somewhere here. King e4, king f8, and f5. I just dominate my opponent's rook. No moves, no moves. This is not going to go anywhere. And actually, somebody from my team said that I could have sacrificed the exchange here. Take it, a5, that his king is too far away. And I should be able to dominate with the bishop and the pawn, the rook. Actually, this is winning. Here, 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 here. <laughs> But it, it doesn't seem very, very easy, very controlled victory. Although, yeah, it is winning. King b6, a7 is just winning on the spot. So, I was not even looking at this at all. Yeah, by the way, that's, that's, it's, it's funny actually, but that's how we can avoid obstacle of bishop endgame. By sometimes sacrificing the exchange and you still have those pawns at the bishop against the rook. So I played a5 here. And now my task is very simple. C3 and try to get to the pawn on a5. Check. Here. The pawn on a5 is weak. Here. And now this is where the first time control ended. And I had plenty of time. I had extra half an hour. And I was looking. What's the fastest victory here? How do I get the fastest way to the point? How do I get the fastest way from point A to point B? And I was looking at f6, trading with the mate, try to trade this pawn for this pawn, take it, rook f5, here, here, he's going to go after the pawn on h3, here, here, here. And I was thinking, how clean is this? It doesn't seem very clean. And why is this? He has counterplay. I'm looking for a forced win. Okay. Then I'm thinking, what if I play rook b7 and go after this pawn? He goes here. I cannot play king e4. He goes here. I cannot play bishop e4. He goes here. So I'm thinking, okay, what if I go here like this? And I keep my three pawns. How clean victory is this? <laughs> so I have three pass pawns. Uh, probably this pawn is going to promote. Uh, the power of this bishop is that it keeps these two pawns on the same diagonal. That should be pretty important. And I thought, this is too long. <laughs> I mean, naturally it's winning, but he has some counterplay, you know? Maybe I'm going to miscalculate something. 
I'm looking for something more easy. And that's when I decided to have a paradoxical solution to play for the piece domination. Maybe it's not really so paradoxical, but it's paradoxical with the, doc, with the obstacle of bishops. Because now it pretty much negates this b pawn, which is now blocked. But I made sure black has no counterplay with the rook. And I was thinking that if he's going to play uh, something like uh, king e7, c5, king f6, I can always imprison the rook. And then essentially I'm playing a game without, without the rook on a7. It's just an extra rook. So whatever. I mean, maybe the king goes to the rook on a7. Maybe I find a way to get to b6 or to b8. doesn't matter. It's just an extra rook. Uh, so I thought that should be that should be winning. Yeah, bishop b4, rook b4 takes king c5. Maybe there's the fastest win. So, um, uh, maybe even c7. Yeah, maybe even c7. Yeah, by the way, yeah, by the way, c7. I didn't even see that. <laughs> so what happened in the game is that he played immediately rook a7, and after bishop b7, um, bishop b4, king e4, he resigned. So the point is, I want to play king d5, c5, c6. So the bishop b4, his idea was to offer this trade, which maybe is winning. But, I mean, it's a rook game, right? I still need to show quite a technique. Probably not a very difficult one. And also the same applies for bishop, uh, bishop f2. I play king e4, here, here. And pretty much inevitably, at some point, I'm going to play c5 and trap the rook. So that was the idea, and uh, there's nothing he can do about it. So apparently this was the fastest victory in prison, the rook on a7. It has no good moves. And black resign. So overall, it did feel that I'm like a new minister of defense <laughs> in the game. But the engine, it's quite funny. It said that, it said that th th this is nothing. Uh, black has zero compensation. Actually, that was quite a surprise to me. So bishop f4 was the strongest move here, and uh, I was quite surprised about this position. The engine says white has a winning position. I would have never guessed. Never guessed. I felt that I have two extra pawns, but he is so active. He has the open b file, he has knight f3 thread, he has rook e8. I felt that maybe I'm slightly better. Because I, those, I have those two pawns, I can maybe give up one pawn, give up the second pawn to solve my problems. So I didn't feel really feel that I have any real danger, but I felt that I need to be tactically alert. And I was so surprised when at home I found the engine was saying what is winning. So this means it's just two extra pawns and Black's lead in development doesn't mean a thing. So that was like, uh, what? Yeah, so that was incredibly, incredibly surprising to me. And apparently, in this particular position, Black's lead in development and active pieces don't mean a thing. So that was quite incredible. So I played a very, very nice defensive game here. So all of these moves are absolutely best. The best. A3, King of One, Knight C3, Knight E5. Very powerful idea. Bishop F4. And uh, at some point, Black simply ran out of moves. So. Technically, Rook D1 was not the best, but it was the cleanest, the cleanest move. And uh, despite the fact that we have obstacle bishops, we have double pawns. It's the two pawns, extra pawns at the queen side, which the side effect of the game in favor for White. So he made all the logical moves, but as soon as I got to trade one pair of rooks, the game was already completely decided.